I feel like, I mean, everybody must want to come out here and dance or something, right? It's uh, good to be with you all again. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm Washington editor at large of The Atlantic, and I'm having a great day. I, I just heard, I do not know what my, my team are talking about, but at the big party after this, there's some surprise. If anybody knows what the surprise is, will you please text me or tweet me, because I'm wondering... You know, I'm just wondering what it is. Now, now we're going to get back to the real business here. We're going to talk about living with risk and designing a better system. Uh, we've talked about many, many corners of the Katrina disaster that happened here. Many people lived through that, including one of our, our guests here. Uh, just to my right, we've got Karen Durham Aguilera, who is Director of the Contingency Operations and Office of Homeland Security and the Director of Task Force HOPE. Uh, in New Orleans for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. She also is a champion, was a champion bodybuilder. Uh, she was deployed and stationed in Iraq when uh, Katrina hit and has some interesting insights into that. Uh, and we also have Mark Schlefstein, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning environmental correspondent for NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. So it's great to be w with both of you. And I thought, you know, part of the, the conversation that's been happening in the media and here is, is around the subject of the infrastructure failures that happened when Katrina came through 10 years ago. And you were telling me in the green room that you've been listening all day and no one has gotten it just right in terms of talking about what, giving us a snapshot of what infrastructure is in place today, what you've built. So could you give us that, Karen, that give us that snapshot? Yes, good afternoon. So you know, it's really been such a good day to listen to all the different perspectives. And I, I just also have to mention the incredible bright young people that were been on the stage several times today. I just, I just can't say enough about hey. how impressed I am. Okay. So several things. So we were able to put a system in place after Katrina that is, is said to be built for the 1% chance of hurricane storm surge risk every year. And so that's every single year you have 1% chance of a certain size storm and surge uh, that could happen from a hurricane. But when we went about the system, we also had the, I'll call it the fortune, to be able, we the Army Corps of Engineers, to be able to define uh, new modeling techniques, hydraulic modeling. Um, we used, instead of the past uh, storm that could happen, we used 152, both past storms and potential storms, uh, with 150 tracks, anywhere from a 25-year to a 5,000-year rate of return. And then we were a also able to build additional risk and uncertainty into the system. And so the system we have in place is, is far more robust than what the standard uh, industry standard of that 100-year, 1% chance is. Uh, another thing that we did is we projected for 50 years, uh, not just for climate change and sea level rise, but especially for um, subsidence. I don't know if we talked about that much today. But the amount of subsidence that has happened along the entire state of Louisiana since 1932 is far more important a factor than sea level rise. And so at that time, we were able to project what conditions we could expect 50 years with all those uncertainties built in and that suite of storms. And that's what we designed for. And so the point of all that is, um, is a system that's, that really is resilient to a storm uh, such as Katrina or bigger if it comes in, if you would have to have a surge of anywhere from 25 to 30 feet to actually overtop some of the system that's in place. It went over top all of it. And so you would have some interior flooding, but that's what the interior drainage and all those pump stations, everything is for, to take that water out. So the system will stay there, and that's what we designed for. And I guess before I jump to Mark, because I'm going to ask him the same question in a moment, is that enough? Because if you read the media here, the, the, the fragility, the nervousness that you still feel when people talk about Katrina and then talk about the future is, there's this sense that it's not enough. Well, you know, to really have enough, you know, first, to uh, quote Mayor Landry earlier, there's no such thing as no risk, whether it's hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, wildfires that's going on right now in parts of the country. You can never totally reduce the risk to anybody from getting hurt, whether it's a natural disaster or a man-made event. And so when I hear that, is it enough, it's really a question of how much do you want to invest to reduce the risk as much as possible, and there, that's a shared responsibility to reduce risk. There's the structural, such as what the Army Corps has done. There's the non-structural. You can reduce energy with natural features, environmental features. 
And then there's things that people and businesses can do, elevating their homes, having an anchor and foundation, having room if they can have it between their property and the coastline, uh, listening to evacuation orders, you know, buying flood insurance. You put all of that together, and that's the best way to reduce your risk. Mm -hmm. And you'll, you won't totally reduce it to nothing, but you'll, you'll greatly mitigate um, what, what could have happened if you had not done all those things. Mark, is it enough? Um, no. And uh, let, me, let me start by saying that uh, whenever anybody asks me about this, I, I start at the point where what I call the devil's bargain occurred. Uh, and that was immediately after Katrina. Uh, a decision was made that uh, the city of New Orleans would be rebuilt. Uh, to be rebuilt, uh, you had to guarantee that people would live here, and that meant you had to have flood insurance. Uh, to get flood insurance, the Congress has set a, a, this 1% limit that is based on, on actuarial uh, things that are uh, you know, 50, 60 years old or way out of date. Everybody says that. Uh, National Academy of Sciences has said it's outdated in like five studies this year. Um, and so you've got this 1% standard for how high things should be, and that's not enough. Now, to, to everybody's uh, uh, benefit, uh, the Corps went further than that and made sure that not only was, was this new height uh, much better than what it was before, and you can see that out in the east where mm -hmm. the levees prior to Katrina were supposed to be 17 and a half feet, were only 15 feet, but today they're 32 feet above sea level. So that's twice as high. That's wonderful and that's great. But the more important thing is that they've added resiliency to protect us from a 500-year event, an event that's actually uh, a bit, bit more than uh, Katrina. And resiliency means that the levees will still be there when the storm passes by, which means that you will have the reduced flooding that she's talking about. But there are other events that are out there uh, that are going to occur in the future, and it could be 500 or 1,000 year events that are going to cause overtopping and will disrupt the city. The other important thing is that people need to recognize, uh, you heard earlier today that uh, the mayor talked about category three, category five, forget it. Don't talk categories. That's wind strength, and that's not our problem. Our problem is water. So you're saying that Mayor Landrieu is just completely wrong. Uh, he was when he said that, yes. Mm -hmm. And and why I, I say to, that? That's what I call a tweetable moment. Okay. And why yeah. why I say that is yeah. because you can we can have a category two or even right. even smaller storm in terms of wind speed that has a storm surge coming with it that will overtop the levees. You were both saying a category people, one could do this. It, right. it could. Yeah. You know, it's not often that I agree with Mark, but on the, in this case, I, <laughs> I mean, in this case, I agree with Mark. It's not the category, which is the wind speed. You know, wind, wind can be a problem and can damage things as well. It's the amount of surge that's brought in. And so if you look at Hurricane Camille and Hurricane Betsy, they were both category five. They had wildly different surges than Katrina, one about half as much and one more so. If you look at Isaac that hit, you know, in 2012, Isaac was a Category 2 at best. It was a big storm, I and mean, it, had, it had effects all the way into Kentucky, and it was a big rain event, something else that Katrina didn't have. But the surge that it brought in was in different places, it was 12 to 15 feet. So when you measured the 1%, and you took all of this historical data, you expanded it, you, you said, okay, we're going to have some violent storms on top of this, are you... Are you not countering, you know, figuring in what Mark just laid out, that basically you can have smaller storms with higher surges. So we're, are we really well, deluding we ourselves? No, that we, were that. we were figuring that. We were figuring Remember, the, yeah. the 1% is an insurance standard. National right. Flood Insurance Program is based on the so-called 100-year, which in different places of the country means different things. In a lot but of places, it's river flooding. you just a bunch of storms that have come I did. every other year. But what we designed for, because we, we were able to do so, is that we took 152 storms, anywhere from 25 years to 5,000 year rate of return, took the effects of those, of those storms across the, the physical footprint. We let, I mean, I'm an engineer, I try not to sound like a nerd. But we generated over, almost 63,000 hydrographs. And then we added the risk on top of that. So that's far and above what, what a, what a so-called you know, 100 year, 1% system would be. But that's not the case if you look at different parts of the country. I, I was really taken by Administrator Fugate's um, session earlier today, and he named several cities that he saw as being more vulnerable. Norfolk. Uh, Norfolk is one of them. And when we, after Hurricane Sandy, and I could talk at length about that, but earlier this year, we were able to publish a North Atlantic Coast comprehensive study. Uh, Congress basically appropriated mm -hmm. $20 million for us to do a vulnerability study across the, the Atlantic seaboard. 
And we were able to set a risk framework that communities could look at for, for advanced planning and what, what are all the different actions that people can do that we've mentioned to put together to reduce their risk. Well, we also named several cities that were vulnerable to surge flame. Norfolk's one of them. Mm. You know, there's areas in New York and New Jersey, Washington, D.C., and so we do have some new studies starting up to try to improve things in those cities. And then Craig also mentioned several others that, that don't have the ability to evacuate the way you do in New Orleans or don't have, certainly don't have a perimeter protection like we do here. Mm. Mark, so take us back for a minute. You, you, you wrote and reported through the entire storm. You lost your home, uh, basically, uh, in, in the process of this. And we were talking about that because I went back to read a great deal of your writing, and there's, a, there, there's, an, there's an emotional element in, in your writing about these issues, that you're not easily deluded by numbers or commitments from the Army Corps of Engineers and others. And so what would it take for you to feel confident in the future, for New Orleanians who've, who've been here for a long time to feel confident in what they're hearing at, at, at gatherings like this about what FEMA's doing, what the Army Corps of Engineers is doing? Because I don't believe that you have that confidence. Well, I, I do, but you have to, you have to understand the risks that you're facing and then make a decision as to whether or not that risk is what you want to live with. I've made that decision. I see this levee system and, it's, and it is amazing. I mean, uh, the, the things that, that these guys have done to rebuild the system, they have completely redone the way that you make uh, water structures in the world, not just in the United States. And those, those lessons are huge. That's great. But we still have risk here, and that risk will be increasing in the future because of sea level rise and because of uh, the increase in strength of hurricanes, not the, not the number of hurricanes, but the increase of strength in hurricanes, and by the additional factors of uh, what kinds of rainfall we'll get upriver from New Orleans. This year, uh, it, the river today is still at eight feet. Well, if we had a Katrina today, you'd have water probably going over the top of the, of the river levees into the city, possibly. Two weeks ago, you would definitely have a heck of a lot of water going into, into the city. And those are additional risks that we have to understand and deal with. The, the Corps actually has already been dealing with that by raising the, the, the river levees as well, uh, by recognizing that in the future you've got to do that. The, the other problem, though, is that the Corps of Engineers builds projects, we all do, uh, on either a 20-year or 50-year uh, time frame. The new levees are built on a 50-year time frame. We're already, what, mm. eight years, 10 years into that 50 years? 2057 is the end of that period. Mm. Um, so we need to look forward and make sure that we are ready with enough money to raise those levees as they need to be raised. The uh, localities are already doing that in advance by, in some cases, before the last step of armoring is occurring, uh, adding to the height of the levees before that additional uh, fabric mat is put down on, on the earth and levees so that they can get a couple of extra years out before they have to spend a heck of a lot more money. Those are issues that we're all going to have to face, just like we also have to face the, the issue of recognizing that even with this system, this system is built to protect our property, not our lives, and that we have to leave when people tell us it's time to leave. Do you have a good system to leave here um, in yeah, place now? Yeah, I, the, one of the benefits uh, of pre-Katrina and Katrina Ha, ha, has been that uh, our uh, evacuation system has been dramatically uh, improved. Uh, ironically, one of the things that people lose in this whole issue about Katrina and the number of deaths that did occur is that it was the most successful evacuation in the history of the United States. You had 1.2 million people from the New Orleans metropolitan area who left in advance of the storm. It wasn't enough. Uh, there were major failures that were, that were made in terms of getting people out who didn't have transportation. Those issues seem to have been solved under the present government structure that we have today. One of the things that a lot of people forget is that every four years we change governments. Right. That can change. That can change at the state level with a completely different um, uh, 
uh, state legislature and governor that can make decisions about how, what they're not going to fund in the future, and it can happen at the national level uh, in terms of uh, changes and where money needs to be placed there as we well. We don't have enough time to go into it, but you mentioned to me, and just nod yay or nay, you said that you've got air-conditioned buses in the plan that will move animals out of animal shelters. Is there, that, there is are that part of the plan? Air-conditioned 18-wheelers. 18 18-wheelers, 18 great. Mark mentioned money. Are you resourced? Is the core resourced to do the things it needs to do here and elsewhere? The core is never resourced to do what we need to do, what we'd like to do. I mean, that's, that is a fact because it's infrastructure, water resources infrastructure is a national investment. You know, for years, for years, this nation was ahead of many others. Mm. And, but all of our infrastructure, most of it, it is old. The average age of our infrastructure, our locks and dams, are over 50 years old. Mm. So when we go to other countries, and we do a lot of technical exchanges in other countries, other countries are looking at us more of our past example, the way that we used to invest in water resources infrastructure. I mean, it is part of our national security and national economy. So if I look at it that way as to how we should be investing, then no, we're not resourced to do what we need to do. If I look at how we're resourced to do the response and the, the early preparation, the things that Administrator Fugate talked about, well, absolutely. You know, one of the things that's totally changed is the way that we do get our teams out ahead of time. We anticipate river flooding or hurricanes. We get teams, we get equipment, uh, temporary power, um, and working with FEMA, uh, staging generators, everything we can think of, and getting our people as close as possible so that as soon as that storm is passed, our team is right there on the ground. And so that is a matter of practice. And I don't think that matters what administration is in place because you know, we have trained and identified cadre, technical team members that are assigned all these different type of things and their commitment is, is when we tell them, we need you to go, uh, you've got a few hours to leave, and this is where we need you to go, they're out there. Uh, there was a typhoon that just hit Saipan a few weeks ago. We had, a team, we had a team there ahead of time on the ground. They're still there doing temporary power. We've got teams moved early in, in Hawaii. Uh, uh, Danny, Tropical Storm Danny, is not going to be Hurricane Danny. We had teams on notice. We don't have to send them because now it's going to bring rain, which Puerto Rico needs. So all these different things where, where the federal response can, can help the local response mm. in anticipating and getting people and equipment and supplies out early, that's a matter of practice now. And so I don't anticipate that changing regardless of what administration. Like and we get, are resourced to I'd do I'd like that. to get a couple of quick questions, so think about them real fast. We've got one over there. But, but real quick, you, you, do you think, I mean, how do I frame this without getting in a lot of trouble? I think the country and its eyes and all are on Louisiana and New Orleans this week. And I think there, it's an opportunity to learn. Are there things that Louisiana has put in place in terms of disaster response, in terms of thinking this models that the rest of the country could actually learn from? Anything in which Louisiana is now the leader? Karen? Well, aside from the risk system and, and having this incredible risk-based system here, it's a lot more than that. One of the things that, that Louisiana has done at, at the GOSEP level, at, at the state level for emergency preparedness, um, is having a big network of businesses that they can reach out to for different supplies, whether it's generator or food supplies or all types of things, and so that when a storm is coming, that GOSEP is able to reach out and to say, I need you to bring these materials to the people who are going to need them. Um, and you should be able so to do that. So those deals are done and in place. Yes, that's, that's in place ahead of time. And so that, that is... Uh, not all states are doing that. I, I really right. am, am pleased to see the way Louisiana has progressed so much in the preparation and training. Another thing that Louisiana has done, um, and this started uh, with uh, Hurricane Gustav, um, it's one thing for FEMA to bring in generators, and the Army Corps is part of, of doing that to get hospitals, for example, you know, back on running as closely as possible when the power goes out. But it's another thing for the state to say that we need more than that. We need pharmacies to be up and running so people can get their, their medical mm -hmm. supplies. You know, we need gas stations to be up and running. And so, so the, the governor's office has identified where are those essential needs so, so for them to be able to have generators and things busy so that people can get back as quickly as possible. So there, that's just a few examples how Louisiana's ahead Quick of the game. Quick thought, Mark. Um, I, I think one of the key things that, that Louisiana did in part forced by Congress was that it set up two uh, regional levy authorities to oversee the individual levy boards uh, mm -hmm. removed, allegedly removed some of the politics at least from uh, the people who participated in, in those uh, authorities and made, them, made sure that they were required to be people who knew what they were talking about, engineers and scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, 
that, that add a lot to it. Um, the one thing that's, that continues to be missing is a recognition of the public of what kinds of risk are out there, as, mm -hmm. as shown by uh, St. Bernard Parish twice turning down a, a, a new tax um, to uh, pay for uh, the upkeep of the mm -hmm. brand new levy system. Wow. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, Hi. I'm, I'm Marcus Smith, and I'm just a resilient citizen. <laughs> um, although I was more resilient 10 years ago, I'm now in my late 70s. You're looking good. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, the options are, uh, well, another conversation. Yeah. Uh, Mark, you're the first person, I think, to mention climate change. Mm. Looking forward, uh, what can you tell us in a short form about how that is going to affect our plans and preparations and the long-term viability of New Orleans as a city? Perfect question. Okay, so, so uh, the, good, the, the first early good part of that is that in this new levy system for New Orleans, uh, climate change was taken into account uh, and uh, there are actually last minute changes that were made in some of the designs to increase the concern about climate change so that they're even better than they would have been but it's not enough. One of the concerns is that uh, even though the Corps used more conservative climate change estimates than it was required to when it was designing the levees, uh, those are already outdated. Uh, there are new studies out this year that indicate that sea level rise will be much higher than, than what we've been counting on. And so we're gonna have to be looking at how to improve, increase the heights of some of these structures that are hard structures that will be overtopped before the 2057 uh, uh, end of their life uh, in some cases if the climate change uh, estimates are correct. Quick thought, reaction on the question? Well, a couple of things. You know, first, you can never, I don't think you should ever defend, depend only on a structural solution. We talk about multiple lines of defense because it's combining the structural with the non-structural, with the environmental features, with all the different things that you can do. The second thing is, everybody talks about sea level rise, but in this area, in Louisiana, far more important factor is subsidence. That subsidence and the rate of subsidence is five to 15 times more than that of sea level rise based on our projections. So we're a lot more worried, more worried about that. Uh, some of the system um, structurally is adaptable to add additional height in the future. Uh, the big wall at the uh, Inner Harbor Navigation Canal, for example, but that may not be the best thing to do. I really have to look at all those other different things you can put together to try to reduce your risk. Mark, uh, we've got to close up, but I wanted to just note that you uh, told me that in an odd way, the BP disaster, uh, in a way, is helping re provide resources that help on some of this with coastal uh, right. restoration. And it was a very provocative comment. Sure. Uh, but why, why, why did the BP disaster inadvertently help? Well, the result is that the combination of fines and settlement uh, packages that are coming out of the BP uh, oil spill are going to add about seven to eight to maybe even nine billion dollars to the state's money that it is setting aside for coastal restoration issues. A lot of those multiple lines of defense, either new wetlands or ridges or other things that will be in front of the levee system protecting the levees. With that, I want to thank Mark Schlefstein of NOLA.com, Times Picayune, and Karen Durham Aguilera. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you.